Campbell takes the snap, looks left under pressure. Oh, it's one over the middle. And he's got Crowder at the 10. Cuts it back at the 5. Go line. Sam Darnold did it again. Jones, pressure takes it away. Bradley McDougal. Jets. And welcome back to another episode of the Cool Your Jets podcast. Your host, Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. The Jets are officially back at training camp. Today was their first day back on the field. They don't get into pads until Monday, um, but Michael and I are, are very excited, as I'm sure all of you are, to see football finally back in action. Uh, Michael, how are you doing, man? I'm doing good, and I'm looking forward to actually – well, not looking forward. Now we actually have them out there on the practice field finally. Uh, so to see that is great, and we're less than a month uh, from the first game of the season. So it's exciting to finally have some real football back. Yeah, I would say the best time of the year is early August, great weather, it's summer, uh, maybe you're on vacation, and then you can just update Twitter every morning and, and read about Sam Darnold on 7-on-7 seven seven drills. It's really probably the peak time of the year yeah, for me We just got year. the first fire starter today with right. Becton uh, getting beat by Q for a tackle for a loss. So offseason or uh, training camp is officially on. Yeah, it sounds like Makai Becton's now a bust, so yeah. uh, we'll plan accordingly. Uh, we uh, did a few episodes this past week uh, that we'll do really quickly, uh, plug them. We had an Adam Gase deep dive, three-parter. It's on the Jets X Factor YouTube. You should go check that out if you want to know more about Adam Gase's strengths and, and weaknesses as a play caller. We also had an episode dropped yesterday um, covering Darnold's statistical benchmark you know, expectations, things that he needs to do in 2020 to prove that he's the, the franchise quarterback for the Jets, um, you know, and, and despite Adam Gase and, and anything else that's, that's going against him. Um, but, Michael, today uh, we put together a list of 10 topics, just 10 uh, kind of bold predictions, I guess. And Michael and I will, will give our takes on each topic. Um, so, Michael, I guess we'll just hop right into it. Uh, the first one was win total. Um, the New York Jets win total in 2020. Obviously, the expectations are fairly low this year, um, especially after losing C.J. Mosley and trading away Jamal Adams a few days before trading camp. Um, but, Michael, I'll, I'll give it to you first. What is your expected win total for 2020? You did write in a whole article, 100 reasons to believe the Jets will make the playoffs in, in 2020. I did. I that's think, actually next on the list, but <laughs> we'll start with wins. I think the first number that comes to mind when I'm asked this question or I think about it is I think eight is what comes to mind first. I could see them uh, maybe getting to nine, even 10 wins. If you can help out Sam Darnold, he gets that protection that he needs. I could see them pushing into uh, the 10 win range, but I think more likely is this is a schedule that does look pretty tough. There are quite a few. I mean, you have both the teams that are in the Super Bowl, Seattle, two trips to LA. So it's a tough schedule. Uh, and I think that um, the way they finished last season, they played a lot of easier teams in that second half. So with the schedule getting a little bit harder, but also getting Sam Darnold, uh, having some more protection for him, and hopefully he plays all 16 games, those things balancing out. I think eight is what comes to mind for me. Uh, and that could be enough for the playoffs. If there were seven seeds last year, the Steelers would have been in uh, in the AFC. So I think uh, eight is what comes to mind first for me. Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, this year for me is not necessarily about wins and playoffs. It's more about Sam Darnold. Um, you could even throw in maybe Quinn and Williams or Mekhi Becton and Denzel Mims. It's the young players. We want to see growth and, and so that the Jets will be competing in 2021 and 2022. Uh, so, yeah, wins for me this year, I agree with you. I think eight. Um, I'm a bit on the optimistic side. I, I do think Sam Darnold will have a breakout year, which makes me lean towards nine. Um, just because, you know, anytime you have a quarterback – that is putting the team on his back. I mean, you're going to win games in this league. Um, you know, I do worry a little bit about the defense. There's really a complete lack of, of pass rush. They will need, you know, something from Quentin Williams to, you know, to avoid being the worst uh, pass rushing team in the league. I mean, Greg Williams does drop uh, quite a bit of pressure himself. So, um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of question marks at corner. Um, you know, the, the supposed strength of the defense, I guess, was inside linebacker, and even that's been depleted with the loss of C.J. Mosley, although it's still better than last year. Um, so a lot of question marks on defense. I trust Greg Williams, though, and I think Sam will break out. So, yeah, I'll go on the optimistic side. I'll go on nine wins despite the tough schedule, um, which takes us right into the next uh, topic, which would be playoffs. And it seems, again, as I said, I, I 
think this season can be a successful one, even if the Jets don't make the playoffs. Um, but Michael, I'll go with you first. As I was just mentioned, you did write a hundred reasons to believe the Jets will make the playoffs. So let's put your money where your mouth is. Do you think the Jets will make the playoffs in 2020? Well, I, I know I said eight wins. And, and, and like I said, last year, that would have been enough if there was a third wild card. Um, but I think the AFC will be a little bit better than that this year because that was probably one of the uh, one of the only times that you know an eight eight and eight team would have been uh, the seven seed in the AFC. So I'm gonna say no, even though I did write a hundred reasons to believe it, that they're gonna make the playoffs. Wow. But um, I know well, any, I'm a complete hypocrite, the, aren't anything, I? Yeah, anything for the clicks, I guess, Michael. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I think I'll I'll say this. I don't, I don't want to say this for sure because but I, but I think like like happen. you said before it's less about the playoffs this year and you like if the Jets are win eight games because Darnold Beckton Mims Ashton Davis Chris Herndon are good uh, but they also don't win more than that because they don't have um, good cornerbacks because Pierre Desir struggles because uh, you know veteran players don't play well that you can replace later on then they're in a good spot going forward you want this year is very much about establishing a core for Joe Douglas to build around more so than it is about competing because they're just not there yet. But I I can't see them totally making the playoffs, even though I did write that I am not going to lean towards it, but, but I'm just really, it's 50, 50. I'm really on a coin toss about them making the playoffs, the Tom Brady being gone and that seven seed in the the extra playoff spot really opens the door for them. I'm going to lean towards no, but I could totally see it. Yeah, this question and the, the, the previous one are completely intertwined because I see the Jets right around that seven to nine win mark. I mean, I think it just depends how, you know, games like uh, games against Indianapolis, games against Cleveland, you know, not blowing stupid games to, you know, Miami like they have pretty much every single year. Like they've lost. I don't think they've won in Miami since Rex Ryan because the, they won in London. But they literally lost – yeah, they have. They've lost every single game in Miami every year. It's like we can mark this as a W. It seems like the, the season's been going down the drain. and like, okay, we'll get a W down in Miami, and it just seems to be the most painful loss. And they can't win in Jacksonville either, but luckily yeah. we don't have to deal with that. State of Florida. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as I said, I, I'll lean to the nine wins for the first question because I'm, I'm a Jets fan and, and I want to be the optimist. But I, I would be fine if they win seven games, and like you said – uh, Darnold balls out and Quinnen shows something. Um, but I do think playoffs are more likely than people think, not just because of the seven seed, but as you mentioned, I don't think this is a particularly strong division. I think it's going to be a close win or close race. Uh, I will say, I do think the jets will be playing meaningful games in December this year, which they haven't really done, uh, in a while since 2015. Um, so I, I, I think that I, and I was, I started to say, I, I don't want to say, I think that'll be for certain because every time I say that it's not, but I, I, I'm pretty confident that the Jets will be playing their last, you know, five to six games meaningfully, and the season won't be ending in October like it has the last few years. Um, but, yeah, with, with New England depleted, you know, you can never discount Bill Belichick, and they, they had a big draft class this year, and Cam Newton's coming. So I think they're going to be around that seven to nine win mark as well. I think Buffalo is worse than people give them credit for, but they are the favorites. Uh, I do think they'll probably be around nine wins. Then Miami, you know – I don't think they're that good, but they probably view the Jets as, as their uh, inferiors as well. And who knows if, if Tua comes in and he plays really well. But I think they're more towards the, the five to eight win mark. So anyways, my point is I think this is going to be the closest divisional race in a long time. Yeah. Uh, and, and I wouldn't discount playoffs. So if they finish towards the top of that spectrum, like I just said, if they get those nine wins, they can steal games against Buffalo and they, they take care of business in Indianapolis – uh, and against Cleveland, I do think they'll go to the playoffs. It wouldn't shock me, but it's not the goal for this season. I mean, obviously, the Super Bowl is goal every year. But for the Jets, if we're setting realistic expectations, it's to see a big jump from Darnold and then growth and establishing that core from guys like Quinnen and Denzel Mims and Mekhi Becton. Yeah, and, and I agree with you. If, if my life depended on it, I would have to say no, they won't make the playoffs just because – that's the history of this team right. <laughs> that, uh, that we're riding on right now, but I can absolutely see it. And that's mostly because of how open the door is with the extra playoff spot with Brady gone uh, and just having hopefully viable protection for Sam Darnold for the first time in his career. And I'll be honest, I'm pretty sure every single year, maybe besides 2017, I have predicted the Jets to win around nine games and make the playoffs. So maybe, I mean, I think that's just the default 
optimistic yeah. fan. But like, yeah, 2016, I thought they were going to make the playoffs. 2018, I was like, well, we got Darnold. And then last year, if you listen to this podcast, I think we said exactly the same thing between eight to 10 wins, and, the, and we think they'll make the playoffs. Yeah, that's so, a perfect prediction where it's like, I'm optimistic, but I'm not but, too optimistic. <laughs> but yeah, but it's like, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see this team only win seven games, uh, maybe even less, just with the tough schedule. But I, I do firmly believe in this core i don't think they're near competing yet i think if they make the playoffs it'll be an early exit it'll be kind of a cinderella type of run um so i think around you know the the narrowly missing the playoffs and going eight to seven wins is definitely a safer take um but i am optimistic and confident that joe douglas will have a solid foundational core to build around with these four first round picks between darnold and becton and and uh and quinnan and etc um, number three on that list is Adam Gase returning in 2021. Uh, I already plugged at the beginning, but you can check out our deep dive on Adam Gase. I would say, well, I'll, I'll give it to you first, I guess, Michael. What are your thoughts on, on Adam Gase? Do you think that he'll return in 2021? Do you think Joe Douglas will be looking to pick, handpick his own head coach? Or do you think he's going to ride uh, with the guy who got him to New York uh, for another year? I'm going to say yes. I feel like that there is a camaraderie there between Gase and Joe Douglas, and like we talked about uh, on a, pr- a few episodes ago and also throughout the Gase film reviews, Gase and Darnold are really connected to one another. So Gase's job security really depends on Darnold's development, how well he plays this year. Uh, and if we do think that Darnold is going to play well behind that improved offensive line, hopefully, um, then I think Gase is going to stick around with him. Now, as from a fan's perspective, obviously the hope is that you don't get stuck in this purgatory where he does good enough to stick around, but yeah, he's not good enough to win a championship. That's where you don't want to be. Yeah. But I do think he, Darnold and the offense as a whole are going to do enough to keep him around. Is that going to be good or bad for the Jets? Hopefully they are good enough to where they build the foundation of an elite offense on a yearly basis, not just good enough to keep him around that's where you don't want to be that's a nightmare right it's the uh, scenario it's, it's the deshaun watson bill o'brien it's the, the texans right. went to the afc championship last year and were winning by quite a bit or i guess the divisional round they think yeah you know, they lost the division run but they, they made a playoff run but if you were to ask any texans fans and their thoughts on bill o'brien not just as a general manager which has been so far pretty bad especially when you look at the value you got for deandre hopkins but most texans fans don't like bill o'brien yet he has gone to the playoffs uh, pretty much every single year. Um, so yeah, that's the, the territory you don't want to enter, but I'll agree with you. I think Adam Gase will return. I think he's not as bad as, as fans think he is. I, I mean, I clearly he has faults and I'm not an Adam Gase Homer and part of me does want to see him go. Um, but I don't think he's nearly as bad. I, I think his, his, his offense was really hurt by a terrible offensive line. Yeah. I mean, and I, these, I, these are all things that we went over a ton over the, the few hours we did in that film right. review. But I think like a lot of fans think he's just a complete zero and destroys everything. He's absolutely not that, but at the same time, he's still well below average to this point and has a lot of proving to do to get past that point. So uh, he, he has a lot to prove this season, but I do think, he'll be back. And, and the tough thing from a fan perspective is that it really seems like ownership when it comes to coaches just does not go into it deeply enough. They'll just go off of, did you compete for the playoffs? Did you go 500 without looking at, okay, was our offense actually good? Did we get lucky to win eight games instead of five because we won a few close games or played an easy schedule, things like that. Right. Uh, that's kind of why Todd Bowles stuck around so long. Uh, the Jets weren't actually – he clearly wasn't the guy, but he stuck around just because they exceeded expectations in 2017 with quotes. But uh, I think that – you know, he, I do think he'll be back. Will that be good or bad for the Jets? I think uh, for it to be good, you have to see the season, the foundation of an elite offense on a yearly basis. Not, okay, he can make them respectable. We need to see potential for him and Darnold to be uh, a top-notch duo. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I do think he'll be back because I, I am very bullish on, on Darnold having a breakout year this year um, for all the reasons we laid out. And I think, yeah, if the Jets are hovering around a 12th to 15th ranked offense, which I think they will be, I think they'll be in that range around 13 or 14. I think Gase is coming back. Um, so, you know, make of that as you will. But I, I do think uh, that the fan 
opinion of Gase will go up after this year, and I think he'll probably return. People may not love him, but I think the the overall sentiment won't be that he's this you know absolute clown that needs to get out of here. It'll be well, you know, look what the steps that they've taken with Darnold. Um, the next one, Darnold t- touchdown interception ratio. Now we did the statistical expectations in our last podcast, but Michael, I'll give it to you first. What do you think, Darnold? Not what you want to see. What do you think Darnold will do? Uh, with his touchdown to interception ratio in 2020, well, assuming I'm, they play 16 games. Right, right. So I think what I put in the expectations article I did and the podcast we did last week, uh, I believe it was 29 to 12. Uh, and I think that's pretty realistic. I think that's around where he'll be uh, playing the entirety uh, of the season, 16 games. If he throws about the same amount of passes that he has per game, which I think was 34 or 35 last year, That'd put him at about 550 passes on the season. So if, if he did improve his interception and touchdown rates a little bit or enough to the point where we'd be happy with where he's at to an above average level, that's about where he'd be. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with the numbers that I laid out from doing all that research. I think 29 touchdowns, 12 picks is where he'll be. And, and that's a very, very good step forward and a good place to be for him. Uh, yeah, I actually had him at 29 touchdowns and 11 interceptions. So very oh, similar. I know I, I was, I was very close to putting it at 30, but again, with this, when it comes to the nine wins versus 10 it's wins, just that first digit, you don't want to put yeah, it, into I, that 30 it was range. like, it was like pricing something at 1999. I didn't want to have that number be 20. So yeah, I put it at 29 instead of 30. Um, but yeah, I, I do think you're going to see his production go up quite a bit. I mean, you just saw it over the last eight games. Not every game was, was great, but I, I, I do think that the experience in Adam Gase's offense, allowing him to just play more, uh, I, I am buying into the Sam Darnold hype. I think he'll come down, cut down on the interceptions. I put it to 11 um, because I don't think, and we talked about this, I don't think that his reputation as a, as a turnover-prone quarterback is actually necessarily accurate. Right. Um, it's really those, what you, what you laid out was it's four games in his two years that have accounted for half of his interceptions. So if he can avoid any of those traumatic you know four interception games um which he has not been able to do uh, i think you'll see that interception be interception rate be a lot lower uh he seems to be a guy that if he can just limit it to one kind of bonehead throw every i mean he's gonna throw interceptions maybe they're not bonehead just because that's his style of play he's kind of a bit of he's a bit of a gunslinger if he sees an option downfield versus an easier option five yards away from him he's gonna try that option downfield uh, and that's going to lead to interceptions. But I, I think they'll overall come down um, to 11. And then 29 touchdowns, I do think this offense will be much improved. Um, and, and, yeah, I, I think he'll be uh, – would that put him second on uh, – that might, that might tie him for second on all-time Jets touch. I know Fitz has the lead with 31. I think Sanchez put up close to that in his – I think third. that would put him second. I think that would. But you're right. I think Sanchez's 2011 is, which is insane to think that Ryan Fitzpatrick and Mark Sanchez have your two best <laughs> touchdown seasons. But I'm pretty sure that does, uh, that would, those two are the top two seasons, Fitzpatrick right. and Sanchez. I actually have the list right now. I pulled it up. I was stalling right there. So Fitzpatrick <laughs> is number one with 31, and Vinny in 1998, okay. 29. So Sanchez would t- or Darnold if you put up twenty nine would tie for okay. second. Okay, and then was Sanchez twenty six or something? Is that what Sanchez it was? had uh, twenty six? Yeah, yeah okay. just tied for third most. Okay, yeah, I think I think he'll work his way into the top three this year for sure. Uh, at least that that should be the hope. I wouldn't I wouldn't mind Darnold just busting out for thirty five and blowing right. all these ridiculous names off the top of this list. Yes, Are we the more we can just bump Ryan Fitzpatrick down the list. Vinny's all right, I guess, but. I, can't, I guess we can't have him without Ryan Fitzpatrick now. Um, and I, I'm very – yeah, I, I would say that I'm, I'm confident that Darnold's going to be at least third on that list by the end of 2020. I think he does have a good chance to break the, the passing yards record for the Jets. Right I now think it's 4,007 the- for Joe Namath. He, and that's not even that much in today's league. That would have ranked – if you put up 4,007 yards in 2019, you would have ranked – uh, 11th in the league so it's not even that much if he could stay healthy for all 16 games I think he can be in I think Darnold range. could break all of the Jets passing records and still ultimately be a, I'm not saying he will be but I'm saying the Jets passing records are so yeah. mediocre that he could break them I mean, all. I, we're talking about these records but let, let's be clear beating these records is not the, that's what I'm saying the measuring like, stick he Darnold. could break them he could break them and then the Jets could move on from Darnold in a few like years he, he's already their all-time leader in passing yards per game though the Jets have been so bad there it doesn't doesn't matter at all 
I don't even know. Wow. He's already the all-time leader in passing yards per game. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but we're excited about Darnold. I, I do think that he'll he'll work his way up the charts in the, the terrible Jets records. Um, the fifth topic, most disappointing player uh, for the Jets in 2020. Michael, we were talking about this before. In order for somebody to be disappointing, the expectations have to be pretty high on this player because we were like, well, I can't just choose some, you know, fourth round rookie or something and say he's disappointing. It has to be somebody that Jets fans are, are optimistic about in order to justify that disappointing rating. Before we get into 2020, who was the most disappointing player last year? Probably Bell, I guess. Um, yeah, I think it, from a probably Bell from a production standpoint. Not, you know, obviously we've talked about it a million times. It wasn't really his in fault. his control, but from a production standpoint, it's probably but him. But when you were talking, when we did this podcast last summer, and we were talking about how excited we were for Le'Veon Bell and our stat predictions for him. Uh, if you were to tell us the result of it, we would be disappointed. So that's kind of the goal for it. Um, so, Michael, for 2020, who do you think will be that player? I, I think there are a few that come to mind, mostly additions made by Douglas, and not to knock his additions because we know what the approach was, to keep it cheap, short-term, um, kind of help them compete right now without sacrificing the future too much. But I think – Three guys come to mind, Rashad Perriman, George Fan, and Pierre Desir. I think there is a legitimate downside with those three. They all have very good upside as well. It's kind of the approach that Douglas took with these short-term signings. But out of those three, I think Desir is probably the most likely. You son just of because a bitch. Of... <laughs> I know. I took yours. <laughs> Before the podcast, we were, we were talking about it. I was like, I think I'm going to go with Pierre Desir for the most disappointing. Like, I, oh, I actually a good forgot one. about it, to be completely honest. So. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. So you can take one of my ideas now, but I think, right. I think cornerback is just a position where it's really easy to have a random down year here or there. And not that, you know, this year did have a down year last year, but it's, it's a position that's so volatile with its production. Uh, and I could really see him uh, quickly being benched uh, for, with all the depth they have at cornerback, I could quickly see him yielding his starting spot to Bryce Hall, Arthur Millette, even Quincy Wilson. Uh, Millette actually was getting first team reps in the, on the first day of practice. Uh, so, so I, I could, I think this year is probably the most likely. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I obviously agree with that. Um, if I had to give another one, um, Brian Poole, maybe, I mean, uh, he had okay, a okay. tremendous, I, actually, I like that. That's really yeah, bold. Okay. That's, well, I, that's a good one tomorrow on jet jets X factor. Why Brian Poole have a disappointing 2020 by Michael <laughs> Nania. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, he obviously had a tremendous 2019 season and I am hoping to see that again. And I do think that there's a good chance that we will see it again, because uh, if you watch the film, he was really did everything for Greg Williams's defense, but whether it be an injury or reverting back to the mean of his career, because if you look at his 2018 and 2017, he was not necessarily that player. Um, and then when you factor in the lack of a pass rush, the lack of other cornerback depth. Who knows if he's going to be forced to play outside or strong safety. I think Brian Poole is going to have a worse 2020 than 2019. So I'll, I'll put him as my mis most disappointing. This year is my go-to guy. The other, and you, you talked about one of them, between George Fan and Chuma Doga, I think one of those guys has a good chance to be disappointing and then one of them surprising, I guess. I think you're going to get hot and cold. Not both of them are going to hit. But I think there's a chance that George Fan is actually going to be surprising and better than, than people thought. And Adoga is going to be looked at as another Mac bust. But I also think there's a chance that Fan could come out and really suck for the first three weeks. He gets replaced by Adoga and Adoga, um, you know, shows that he can be potentially a long-term starter at right tackle. Um, but I'll go with Brian Poole. I think that's a cleaner answer. Um, for my most disappointing that's player. a really good pick he's not a low hanging fruit I feel like but there is what you said just reverting back to me he was amazing last year uh, but because he was so good uh, and that's such a far departure from where he was the first three years of his career there's a good chance he takes a step back I think he's still going to be good this year but the elite numbers that you know I've posted a lot about him some of the numbers that he put up just top five across the board and so many different things as blitzer coverage run defense that level it's it's likely he takes a step back but i i still think he'll be pretty good but that's a good pick on your part well i mean and who knows i mean it kind of reminds me there's always the demario davises of the world where they have an amazing season right. and we're like yeah well he's probably going to revert back to what he was the jets let him go and now he's you know all pro linebacker for the saints and brian Poole's only 27 i guess he'll turn 28 in october but um 
for the Jets' sake, I really hope that's not the case. It'd be terrific if we could have one of the best slot corners in the league, especially on that deal. They'll probably have to sign into a bigger deal after this year. Um, but I think he's he's definitely a candidate in addition to those three uh, vets, uh, low risk vets that Joe Douglas brought in uh, to be uh, disappointing. As far as most surprising. Uh, Michael, I'll let you go first. I don't think I, I let you in on any of my ideas for this one. So let's see you uh, w- what you came up with. I th- I'm going to go with someone on the oh. defensive front oh, no. that I think, oh my oh, no. God, I think oh, no. I might have, I think I might have taken yours. I think I might have taken him. Okay, here he is. Nathan Shepard. Oh, okay, good, good. All okay. Right, we're, all right, we're good. Okay, so I, th- <laughs> I think that Shepard has a chance to Next to Quinn and Williams, those two guys next to each other really form a good, a very good pass rushing duo. Quinnen had a very good final four games of the season. Doesn't show up in sack column, but you look at his film on a snap to snap basis, he was a lot better. But Shepard, throughout the entirety of the eight games he played last season, after coming back, uh, coming back from suspension, very good as a pass rusher, produced a lot of pressure for his position. And I think those two guys next to each other can really take over as the starters of the future and become one of the better interior pass rushing duos in the league, reminding the Jets of some of the tandems they've had uh, over the past decade and also throughout their history of uh, really good interior pass rush duos. I think Shepard is going to be this season more than just a good situational guy, but a a very good all around force. Yeah. If you want to find the most surprising player, uh, you should definitely look at the defensive line because I think you could choose any of those players, just because I think this, this unit is so underrated by the rest of the league. I think Nathan Shepard's a good pick. I think Quinn and Williams is going to have a better year, but even guys like you look at Kyle Phillips. Uh, I think Steven Clennon's obviously underrated fully fought Ocasi had a tremendous year last year. I think John Franklin Myers will, you know, be getting considerable playing time this year. And I think he'll get around three to five sacks this year, but the guy I'm going with is Terrell uh, Bashamp. I think that he had a really strong close to 2019. I really liked what I saw from him. Um, was a former first or second round draft pick from the Colts. Um, but he, I mean, he really just balled out for, for Greg Williams uh, last year. So I'm buying into to the Ter- Terrell Bashamp hype because I think somebody in that unit needs to give the Jets a pass rush. I think Quinnen will provide some of it up the middle. Uh, I think you'll get some from, from Jonathan Franklin Myers, Jordan Jenkins will get you his seven to eight sacks, but I think Bashan will be the guy that can maybe get nine or 10 sacks and be like, wow, you know, that was actually solid edge, uh, you know, solid edge rushing presence. Uh, I, from- I really love that pick. He's one of my most, fa- one of my favorite underrated players on the team, yeah, but I'm, I have I'm glad to ask I- this question. I have to ask I'm, this question. I'm glad I let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> How is it pronounced? You said Basham. I always call him Basham. You know Bro what? Basham. I, I as I was right. saying it, because I wrote it down, and as I was saying, I was like, is it Basham or is it Basham? I think it's it's Basham. Ba- <laughs> yeah, Basham definitely doesn't sound right. So it's I'm Basham. just gonna, you know, good I'm pick, too- but the pronounce poor, poor execution. Yeah, poor execution, okay. but a great Basham. pick. I agree with you though. He's a really also in addition to what can, can I cut you off? I think go ahead. Go definitely ahead. a commentator this year said Basham because I used to say Basham. Yes. There's a reason someone, I started saying did, Basham. Someone did say it. Now now that you mentioned that, I, I'm pretty sure someone said that. There were a lot of names they mispronounced. It's probably like Rod, Rodney Barber who was calling Robbie Anderson Robbie Williams the entire Giants <laughs> game. Um Okay, well, Basham, my my apologies. But I do think Good that he's up. he's a candidate to lead the and Giants. I, I like his versatility. He's Pretty good for an outside linebacker in coverage. Good motor against the run. And he's uh, had an, an above average pressure rate last year. So he's, he's a really good versatile outside linebacker. I like him quite a bit. That's a good pick. As I said, I'm glad I let you go first. Um, who will lead the Jets in receiving touchdowns this year? Now, it's not limited to just receivers. Obviously, the outside weapons between Denzel Mims, Rashad Perriman, and Vincent Smith. Have some question marks to say the least. You know, in the slot, James Crowder and Braxton Berrios. Tight ends, you got Chris Hearn and Ryan Griffin. And then running backs, you got Le'Veon Bell, Frank Gore, and the Michael P. Ryan. So, Michael, who do you have leading the Jets and receiving touchdowns in 2020? Or George Fant. And they, they put him at tackle eligible on the goal line, and he racks up some touchdowns. Well, George Fant would be a very good player to put some money on. And I think you can make quite a bit <laughs> if that did turn out to be the case. But if it did turn out to be the case, the Jets – uh, probably would win one or two games. So hopefully that doesn't turn out. <laughs> but this is a really good question because when we were thinking of topics, the first one we came up with was receiving yards, but Crowder seems like a very heavy favorite to lead there. But touchdowns is a little tougher to predict. Last year, 
Crowder and Anderson tied with six touchdowns, I believe, to lead the team. Uh, now Anderson will be your place with Perriman. You have Chris Herndon coming back. Uh, Griffin had five touchdowns, even missing the end of the season. So it was really close, and now you mix everything up a little bit. So I think for me, my gut feeling is Chris Herndon. Yeah. I think he's going to score probably, and I don't think he'll score a lot. It's, I think it'll be a very evenly distributed like last year. Hopefully more touchdowns being spread around. Uh, but I could see Herndon scoring six or seven touchdowns to lead the way. But Ryan Griffin could just be a red zone monster and not catch a lot of passes or produce a lot of yards, but catch a lot of touchdowns. I could see him being that kind of player. Uh, Brashad Perriman could score quite a bit if he maintains what he did at the end of last year. Um, so I think there are quite a few options. And Mims, too, is a very good red zone option. He led the nation in intermediate touchdown catches last year, 10 to 19 yards uh, through the air, but led the nation in in touchdowns in that range. So there are a lot of good candidates, but I'm going to go with Chris Herndon. He and Darnold had a very good connection brewing. I think he's going to be the go-to red zone guy. Right, and when we talked about establishing a core for Joe Douglas, Chris Herndon's another one of those players that even if the Jets don't have a winning season or they don't go to the playoffs, you'd love to see him and, and Darnold rekindle that, that connection they had at the, the end of 2018. I think you made a few really good points there. Um, one is that Darnold really does like spreading the ball around. He doesn't, so far in his career, hasn't had one receiver that he really completely relied on, especially in the red zone. Uh, I agree that I think it'll be Chris Herndon, I think for a couple of reasons. I think when you look at the amount of, uh, would you say Ryan Griffin had five before missing the end of the year? Yeah. You also have to remember that Darnold, didn't really get to play with him until uh, what was that week six against the Cowboys. Um, then, you know, he had the whole seeing ghost thing. Uh, obviously he loves the tight end position. He loves Chris Herndon. Uh, so I think that'll be the, the leader in, in touchdowns. I could see what, what you said though, is could Ryan Griffin steal some of those touchdowns from Chris Herndon? Um, so I'll go Chris Herndon as my first option, but if, let's say Ryan Griffin steals three, because by the way, I was going to say, I think Chris Herndon will have eight touchdowns. But let's say Ryan Griffin steals two or three and Chris Dern is knocked down to, to six or seven touchdowns um, or five or six touchdowns, I guess, excuse me. Uh, Denzel Mims is definitely the, the next uh, candidate for me is when you look at his red zone production in college, I, I think it may take a few weeks, especially now that he has a hamstring injury and, and there's not really much of a off season for a rookie like him. Uh, I think the latter half of the season especially after that by those last six games, I think you're going to see Denzel Mims put up a lot of numbers especially in the red zone. Darnold has not had a guy like him yet, a big athletic fast guy who can win those jump balls. And when Darnold is under pressure on the, the 10, 15 yard line, and he's rolling out and trying to buy time and, and create something. He can throw it up to, to Denzel Mims, which is something that he hasn't had. And so I think you'll see a lot of touchdowns from him. I'll go Herndon as the leading uh, as the leader in touchdowns, but if it's not him, I'm going to go with Mims. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, I think Mims and Griffin are close for that second option, but Herndon should be the favorite considering his uh, what he showed in the red zone last year and his his chemistry with Darnold clearly being the best of uh, well close with Crowder but one of the best uh, among all the receivers that they have right now. Uh, our next topic is who will be at the end of the season the best player. We're going to exclude Sam Darnold because I think both of us think that he's the face of the franchise and I think after the year that he has part of that is you know you'll you'll multiply in the value of the position of quarterback and that'll aid his his numbers, but I do think by the end of the year, he'll be viewed as, as the Jets' best player. So outside of Darnold, Michael, who do you think will be viewed at after Week 17 against New England, assuming they play all those games, uh, who will be looked at as the Jets' best player? This is a really tough one. If, if Mosley had not uh, – if Mosley were still around, I, he would be the obvious pick, um, but he's not, and that's really unfortunate. So this, and that makes this question really tough because – there isn't a clear best player now with him and Jamal Adams gone. Uh, last year, the answer to this was definitely Adams. But then following him is where it got really interesting. If you, if you ask me, it was probably, probably Brian Poole. Uh, but then, like we said a few, few minutes ago, it's probably likely he takes at least a little bit of a step back this year uh, just based on normal regression. So I think, I think Le'Veon Bell, if – Obviously, he's obviously the most talented player on the roster outside of, well, probably more so than Darnold, at least to this point. Um, So if they can give him good enough blocking uh, up front, and not just the offensive line, goes to wide receiver, goes to tight end. Denzel Mims is going to help a wide receiver a lot. 
Uh, if they can give him adequate blocking, I think Bell is going to get back up to that top five to 10 running back level and rank top 10 in scrimmage yards. What he does as a receiver, he's always going to give you that. Uh, as a pass blocker, he's still very good there. Doesn't drop a lot of passes, doesn't fumble the ball. So he helps you in a lot of different ways. It's just if they can give him that run blocking uh, to where he could help them get into more second and third and shorts, and that will make a huge impact uh, for Darnold and the whole offense. So I think I'm going to go – I think they're going to do enough to let Bell shine as the elite running back uh, that the Jets paid him to be. Right. I, I hope it's Quinn and Williams. I don't – That's a great pick. I think that that would be the best case scenario. If obviously, you would love to see Mekhi Becton and Mims and Herndon, like we've talked about, take these big leaps. And I think Herndon especially is a guy that is in contention for this discussion because I do really buy the Chris Herndon hype – but Quinnen, I think that if he can have the year, you know, look, a lot of interior rookie interior defensive linemen have quiet years. But if he can separate himself from, from Leonard Williams, the, I guess his predecessor in a way, to becoming a disruptor, Leonard was just quiet for too much. I guess he got some pressures and he was good to run game. But if Quinnen can be a guy that is consistently wrecking havoc on quarterbacks like he was drafted to do – I'm not saying he has to be Aaron Donald, but if he can flash similar qualities as Donald in disrupting uh, and, and creating interior pressure, which is the, probably the most valuable type of pressure. Everybody talks about edge rushing, and that is obviously valuable, and the Jets really lack it. But if you can create pressure up the middle, that's even more valuable because uh, it completely shuts down the run game and it uh, disrupts quarterbacks. They can't really step up. Um, uh, so if a guy like Quinnen could be the best player at the end of the year, uh, that's the best case scenario for the Jets because if they if they have their two key uh, I guess I, I guess stars and and Darnold in the offense and Quinnen on the defense I'll feel pretty good uh, and it'll especially help out Joe Douglas if if Mike McCagman's last two first round draft picks can, can contribute uh, and be uh, leading members of the core um, but I agree with you I think it's going to be Bell and the question that this sparks is because I, I completely buy into Bell and the, the shape that he's in. I think that he's going to be a lot faster this year uh, due to the, 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 uh, the weight loss that he's had. And you just look at the type of shape that he's in. He's clearly committed. Um, uh, I do like that Gase was taking some ownership about the, the usage. Um, you know, Gase is, is very good at, at talking and saying things and it's different on Sundays, but I do believe that he's going to use Le'Veon in some different ways this year. So Le'Veon, I expect to have a, a bounce back year, especially with the improved offensive line. But Michael, is there a scenario in, in your head? I don't know this isn't part of it. And we only have two more after this where Le'Veon does return in 2021, because in my mind, I think it, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion. I was like, well, Adam Gase and Joe Douglas don't believe in paying running backs, big, big dollars. The argument when we brought in Le'Veon, or when we, when the Jets brought in Le'Veon Bell, I, I guess every fan does that. Uh, when the Jets <laughs> brought in Le'Veon Bell in 2018 was, well, he's more than a running back. One, he can be Sam Darnold's best friend in the running game, but he is terrific in pass protection. He, he's arguably our best receiver. Um, so if he dis, uh, uh, displays those attributes to the Jets and he returns to 2016 Le'Veon Bell and he does catch quite a few touchdowns, he does become Sam's safety valve he's obviously proved it off the, the field as, as a leader. Could you see a scenario saying where the jets are like, well, we don't have any big contracts coming up right now. We could afford to keep Le'Veon for another year. Um, uh, especially to just keep helping Sam Darnold out. Or do you think that Joe Douglas and Adam Gase will probably, even if, if Le'Veon has a great year, they'll probably decide, well, look, it was a fun year, but we're building this team for the future. And we don't believe in paying running back that much money. I, I think it's most likely that they do, um, that they do part ways with him after the season. I think that's uh, the more likely scenario just because I think Douglas has clearly shown an understanding of positional value. And um, from, from everything we know now, uh, paying running backs top dollar just is not the smart move. So I do think it's likely. But if they do have a very good offensive season and Bell is a big part of that, then I think they're definitely going to keep him around because of what you said. They – don't have the biggest need for that cap space right now. They don't have a ton of players that they need to extend, if any. And they also don't have a lot of big contracts on the books right now. They trade they trade Jamal Adams, so they don't have to worry about that extension. And there just aren't too many other big deals to worry about besides Mosley. So they, I think that... And, if and his they cap have, number's down next year too. Yeah, and, and that's a big part uh, of his deal. So... I think that if the Jets have a, an excellent offensive season and Bell's a part of it, then he's going to stick around because 
like what we're talking about them doing, just cutting Le'Veon Bell as one of the star backs in the league, it you don't see it a lot. Like the Titans, for example, and not to compare to the amazing season that Derrick Henry just had, but common logic is that you don't pay running backs that much money, and the Titans are most likely not going to win a Super Bowl in the next few years with that core. But after the season they just had, they have to re-sign Derrick Henry. You just have to do it. And so if the Jets are in a similar situation where Bell has an excellent season, your offense is really good, and he's a big part of that, then I think they are going to do it. We just don't see that a lot. Even though that's what we understand now as the right thing to do, teams re-sign their running backs and pay their running backs when they perform. So I think if Bell uh, – well, not that the Jets have to re-sign him, but I'm just saying that if – if he is a big part of offensive success, I think he will stick around another year, mostly because the Jets just don't have the biggest need for the space that he'd open up. But most likely, I, I do think that they're going to explore, if not cutting him, trading him, seeing if they can get maybe a late round pick. But uh, I think that it depends on how well the offense plays as a whole. Yeah, especially if he, he defines himself as Sam Darnold's best friend. If he, does, uh, if he uh, shows that type of relationship where Sam is doing what Big Ben did a lot, where he would go through his progressions and dump it off to Le'Veon, uh, and he clearly just becomes a, a safety valve for Sam. I, don't, I think Joe Douglas is going to struggle taking, uh, getting rid of that, especially with all the cast space that the Jets have, the lack of a big deal, and a lot of draft picks that they can decide to keep Le'Veon Bell for one more year. But I, I agree. I think the, the plan for Douglas right now is probably to move on from Le'Veon after this year, barring a huge Pro Bowl season from him uh like uh 2016 yeah if, if he has the same caliber season as last year and once again it's not entirely entirely to blame on him uh then he's probably gone but the fact that that season was not to blame on him just goes back to the value of the running back position uh, if he's so talented which he is and if he does play so well you know independent of his surroundings which he did and he's still producing at a league worst level it just goes to show how little control running backs have over their actual production. So right. I, I think unless he's elite next year, he's the Doug, Ben Douglas is probably going to move on. Right. Um, this next one, we have two more, is probably the most important on the entire list. Um, what was the best uniform combination from last year? Um, and what will, what will it be this year? And we're not just talking about jersey tops and, and bottoms. Uh, we're talking about the the game, the lighting, the teams yes. they were playing. Yes. We, we, These are the we things do it that, all the way here. It, we're no half measures with the uniform analysis. I mean, these are the things that matter to us here at Cool Your Jets. Uh, Michael, I'll start with you. Two parter, best look last year, considering the lighting, the game, uh, and whatnot. And what will it be this year? What's your prediction for this year? So there are there are a few that come to mind first with the best look. Uh, I think the the Cowboys game, the all white, that really worked. Um, I th- we talked about this one before. This is an underrated one, but the white on green against the Patriots. Most people don't like the white on green or the green pants in any situation, but in Foxborough in week three, while Luke Falk was out there checking the ball down and we were just wondering, uh, just questioning the purpose of our lives watching that game, the uniforms look pretty good. And the helmets were really shiny. The green was good. It was a sunny day out there. They looked good in week three. So those two come to mind first, both with white uniforms or white jerseys, by the way. Uh, I think the black uniforms, I think they look better in the daylight. Most people don't agree with me on this. I posted the poll a couple times. But I think against the Giants, they looked really good in the daylight. Um, So those three come to mind first for me. Uh, also, the All Whites looked good against Cincinnati too. I really like the All Whites, um, so those are the ones that come to mind first for me. Yeah, they got to wear the All Whites more. Michael and I are talking about this. Anytime they have a primetime game, uh, when it's at home, you wear the blacks. If for some reason, let's say a game gets flexed this year and they have another primetime game and they've run out of their three uh, times a year where they can wear the black unis, go white at home. Go all white. I agree with you. The All White at home was probably their best look last year. I agree, I agree with the, the, all the ones that you laid out. I think an underrated one yeah. is week one against Buffalo. I thought the oh, green... And I know I didn't pick the, uh, the best ones for next season, but we could, the uniforms are so important that we could s- separate into another one. So right. you list your favorites and then we'll right. get to next year. I think, I think Buffalo week one is underrated for sure. Yes. I, thought, I thought the green and that uh, looked terrific. It looked more like the... I don't know what it was, but the green was 
it and stood out a lot more in that for game. some reason yeah, these yeah. uniforms reflect the sun i mean the, the old ones did because sometimes they would look brown and other times they'd look black and then they'd look you know, midnight green or whatever but these uniforms in particular really aff- uh, reflect the sun it's mainly the helmet that does that but week one against buffalo i thought that looked really good um but yeah where are the all whites more at home i think that'd be my rule of thumb i think you don't i mean throw the all greens in the trash maybe <sighs> once a year if you want to mix things up but only when the jets are good um so while the jets are bad we could throw those all greens in the trash because those are terrible but yeah i agree with you Keep, go with the white on green sometimes, but I think we got to go back to what Rex was doing. Rex established that all white was our, was our traditional road uniform. I think we got to go back to that. We wear the white on green when it's going to be sunny, like you said. Um, also, if you're playing a primetime game on the road, I think you go all white pretty much every single time. But if for some reason you don't want to, go white with the black pants because that is not against the rules, and I think that would look better. Um, so the, and as far as my picks next year, we don't have any idea if they will even play any of these games what times the games will be at, especially if some of them get flexed to Saturday, what uniforms are going to wear. I'm going to go week one, though, if they wear the greens again, because I think Buffalo could wear all white. That's a definitely a candidate. Week two against San Francisco where they wear the, the – they'll probably wear the green on white. Um, but I guess uh, Arizona, that'll probably be the whiteout game, so I'll pick that one, I guess. But any of the, the primetime games, two against Denver and, and New England, the all blacks, I mean, again, throw the all greens and it's garbage. I don't think Sam Darnold would have been seeing ghosts if he wasn't wearing the, the pickle pants. So, uh, Michael, you, your, uh, your picks for next year? I think all black against New England, the Monday night game in week nine. That's an absolute must. You have to erase the memories of both the Monday night games at home last year. Um, like I said, I'm, I like the all blacks more during the day, but a big part of that is the one game where they wore them at night, they got absolutely destroyed. So, and the two games they played in the day, they won. So that does kind of affect it a little bit, I think, in my mind. So wipe that away. Wear all blacks against the Pats at home. Destroy them. And that should help, uh, that should help repair the image, for me yeah. at least, because I know a lot of people, including you, still like them at night. But all black against New England. And I think, I think the green on white against Buffalo just makes sense. To wear the, the traditional home uniform against a classic divisional opponent, I'd like to see that again when they play the Bills. Uh, and then playing the Raiders at home. I know they wore the green and white against them last year. I'd like to see the all-whites against the Raiders' black uniforms at home. I think that would look good. Good picks. And, and you touched on an important part. The uniforms by themselves are, are solid, you know, but when they win in them, they'll be amazing. I mean, that's the, that's the big thing. If, if we have a bunch of positive memories about these uniforms – I mean, they're going to be the best Jets uniform. Like in 20 years, people will be calling for these uniforms to return. So, right. Um, big thing about them is getting some winning memories in them because currently the the stink of of the one and seven start hasn't necessarily worn off of them yet. Um, by the way, I just like to acknowledge that this is the topic we spent the most time on. So, I guess we should probably <laughs> move on. Um, last one. Um, over. Wait, what? Oh my God. Sorry. Okay. This is, this is why I don't write things down anymore. I was like, Michael and I were talking about beforehand. It's like, Oh, it feels so wholesome to write things down on a notepad. <laughs> and I was like, what the hell did I just write? Overrated, underrated. Um, which opponent on the 2020 schedule do you think is the most overrated and which is the most underrated? I think for me, the most overrated team would prob would probably be one of these, one of the two NFC West teams. If that you say play the one later that I, in the season. If, if, okay. Oh my God. One of them that and, – and this is different now because of a certain trade that just happened, but I think the Seahawks had the potential to be a somewhat overrated team. They won a lot of close games last year, a historic amount of close games. I think they won the most one-score games in history. So they have that going against them, just going back to the median or the mean with winning those close games. And they lost a lot of talent throughout this offseason as well. They – had a big weakness in run defense that they didn't really address, but they did pick up Jamal Adams fixing a need at safety. So maybe the Seahawks won't be as overrated now after that trade, but the Rams, I think are a team that are probably going to be, uh, I think the Rams could be pretty bad this year. They lost a lot of key players, Dante Fowler, Corey Littleton, um, Mikel Roby Coleman, key pieces on defense. And the defense is what carried them last year and their offensive line, which sunk that, the, the reason their offense was so good, big part of it was that O-line. The O-line was terrible last year. The offense took a step back. 
and now they have the exact same offensive line. They didn't make one addition to that unit. So I think the Rams could be, considering their defense is going to take a step back and they didn't really improve the offense, the Rams could be a bad team this year. And they also lost Wade Phillips uh, coaching their defense. So I think the Rams could be a bad team this year. Yeah, I think the Rams is definitely a good pick. Um, I'd throw in the Colts and Cardinals as well, who I think are solid teams. Um, but I don't think that they're, you know, I think the Colts have a great core, but I don't really believe in Phillip Rivers um, right now at, at this point in his career. I think that could be a win for the Jets. Could, you know, if things don't go well against Buffalo week one, it could be their first win of the season, considering they play the uh, NFC champions. Uh, they're defending NFC champion uh San Francisco 49ers week two. I think the Cardinals as well have a lot of fun pieces. I think Kyler Murray's a bit of a nightmare. No Jamal to, to spy on him. So I'm, I'm curious to see what, what Greg Williams' plan will be with, with Kyler Murray. Um, and DeAndre Hopkins is scary, I guess. But uh, or not, I guess, I know. Um, but there's still a lot of holes in that team. I, they're not a complete team. They're, they're similar to the Jets where they have some good pieces, but they, they, they're still a, a, a ways away. So I'm not just saying that's going to be an easy win for the Jets. I'm just saying a lot of people look at the Cardinals now as as one of the top teams in the NFL or something just because they traded for DeAndre Hopkins. It's going to be a tough game for the Jets, but I, I don't think it's insurmountable. Uh, as far as underrated goes, um, the Denver Broncos, because I, don't, I do not know how the Jets are going to defend uh, Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, and KJ Hamler. I think that the core that they built for, for Drew Locke, who had a strong finish to 2019, then you look at the pass rush that with Bradley Chubb, and Von Miller. I'd really like Darnold to, to get back on track on primetime football and have a good performance, but that is a really tough game for the Jets. I just think their secondary is really good too. And their secondary is good. Uh, they have Philip Lindsay in the backfield. Their offensive line has improved. I and just think Melvin that, Gordon in the backfield. Right, exactly. So I think and Noah the, at tight end. They, they have right. a really good team. Exactly. Really team they're, com- they're super under. It really comes down to Drew Locke. And when you look at how he finished 2019, I, I do believe in Drew Locke. So I think that they're one of the most underrated teams in the NFL right now because uh, I'm, you know, pretty And they also signed Graham Glasgow away from us. Yes, exactly. So uh, definitely. The Broncos are that. quietly loaded. Yeah, I know. I think I, exactly. Um, and then the other one, the Broncos is definitely the, the, the obvious pick for me as far as underrated goes. Um, but the Browns, I think, is another one. I think people sleep on the Browns uh, just because of the trash season they had last year. But again, similar to the, the Broncos, they have a ton of weapons. Um, and I don't think the Jets have the pieces to cover those. And Baker Mayfield, you know, I hope he's bad, but I, I do think he's going to improve. I think he's going to actually have a, a much better season. I, I like Kevin Stefanski, especially by week 16. I think he may struggle again at the beginning of the year because it's going to be a new system, yeah, a third system in three years for him, um, and there's not really much of an offseason. But by week 16, he's going to get that system down, and I, I think Baker's going to be back on track as one of the – the more promising young quarterbacks. Um, and they, they yeah, have the biggest dangerous. thing with Cleveland is what they did in the O-line, signing up, signing Jack Conklin and also drafting Jedrick Wills. Right, exactly. And then you got Miles Garrett. They got Denzel Ward. So Cleveland's a definitely a dangerous team. But as far as underrated goes, I think Cleveland for sure. But Denver is, is the one that's not getting any attention, but they're secretly very stacked. Yeah, and, and underrated for me, I mean, the two you picked are probably the best ones. Denver, Denver, I mean, we were just running through their roster. They have a lot of young talent. They can be really good if Drew Locke is the real deal. Cleveland, I agree with you. They, I thought they were going to be good last year. They weren't. But with the help on the offensive line, I think they um, can round everything together. And also the coaching change can really round everything together, allow that talent to shine. Uh, but if there's another underrated team on the schedule – I think those are the two teams. I don't think there's another team out there. <laughs> nice. That's really underrated looking at some of these teams. I don't think the Raiders are going to be that good. I, they do have a good young core. I'm just not sure they have enough defensively yet uh, to be, to step further, much further beyond where they were. The Dolphins, I think, you know, they're better than they, they made a lot of additions in free agency, but Jets fans know that doesn't always work out. Uh, and they also sort of overachieved last year and still only won five games. Uh, so uh, that that team had the talent to win no games at all. So then winning five games was an overachievement. Well, that, that and, could that could point to good coaching, but you know, right? And I guess not that, not according to Minka Fitzpatrick though. If you saw the comments he had about Brian Flores, right? So let, let's hope with Jets fans, it's not. It was just some random Fitzpatrick luck. Uh, and that's another thing. Fitzpatrick is your quarterback again. We know how his career goes. It's up and then it's all the way down. So <laughs> it's probably he's he had a good season last year. 
probably wouldn't replicate that if he plays again. Yeah, but he should, I agree. He should, with you. he should make the playoffs in 2022, but yeah, we're probably in store for two down years here for Fitz. So I, I agree with you. Browns and Broncos are the two teams that I think could be really good in the AFC. All right. Well, that'll wrap it up for us. Um, you can follow us at CYJPod on Twitter. You can follow Michael at Michael underscore Nanny and myself at Ben W. Blessington. You can find this podcast on iTunes and Spotify. We're also uploading all our, ex- or all our episodes to the Jets X Factor YouTube. So make sure you subscribe there. Uh, rate, review us on iTunes. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, you can find our Adam Gase deep dive. You can find our episode we just did on Sam Darnold's uh, statistical expectations as well. So a lot of content coming from us. We'll have even more as the season keeps ramping up. We're trying to do as many episodes as possible. Um, so we look forward to, to coming at you again in, in just a few days. Uh, Michael, any last words? I'm just ready for some football. I hope that uh, everything goes according to plan. So far, things have been uh, re- relatively so, re- not too much to worry about so far. So hopefully that continues. We get 16 games, four rounds of the playoffs, uh, and the Jets win the Super Bowl. Yeah, looking at Adam Gase's beard, it's come a long way since last offseason. So yes. I think that, that bodes very well for the Jets' playoff chances in 2020. So everybody stay healthy, stay happy, and go Jets. Snap, looks left under pressure. Oh, it's one over the middle. Yes.